to begin with, uh, I, I wonder if we can talk a little bit about the work that both of you have been doing with social entrepreneurs for the past 13 years and how that led to the writing of this book. So Mac, maybe you could start us off on that. Sure, well the origin was uh, we felt that there's so much need out there for people to, uh, to be helped and so much funding kind of being used without really accomplishing too much in the way of uh, uh, impact. Uh, not because people weren't well-meaning, but because we needed a more managerial way to look at uh, how, how to provide this assistance to people. And uh, since we were in the entrepreneurship program, uh, one of the things that came to mind as we were talking about this is uh, can we use entrepreneurship as a weapon to tackle social problems? Uh, both of us feel that there needs to be practical things to tell people to do or suggest they do. And uh, we decided that one of the ways to really come up with practical stuff was to go actually go out and try to do it ourselves and, uh, and learn our way into what the methodologies would be to create sustainable uh, organizations that don't create self uh, so dependence, but rather create self-sufficiency. And that was the basic theme. And uh, Jim uh, was the first guy in, in, to, to, to go out there and actually begin to try to do it, uh, working with an entrepreneur who uh, wanted to develop uh, a feeds program to raise chickens. Jim, anything to add? Yes, I think the one of the key distinctions of the approach we took was the use of field research. And uh, social entrepreneurship back then wasn't what it is today. So when we started out the conventional path, there wasn't a lot to go and research in the form of you know, casework and, and uh, other material. And uh, to Mac's point, uh, one of the key outcomes of the research that we were looking for um, was a framework a tool, you know, how do you go and do this and do it in such a way that, uh, that you increase your chances of success and, and minimize uh, the resources used in attempting to do what you're trying to do. So uh, we used field research to learn our way into the space and of course the book is the fruit of uh, the last decade plus of field research. Right. Now one of the ideas that you really emphasize in the book is the idea of uh, pressure testing, uh, the, the, the core idea of the social enterprise. But why is it important for a social enterprise uh, to subject itself to this kind of a pressure test? Mike, you want to take this one first? The theme, if you think about it, is that if there were an easy entrepreneurial solution to the problem, it would have been developed already. And so these are very, very tough, intractable problems. And uh, the characteristic feature of these types of enterprises is huge amounts of uncertainty. And so uh, it's so easy to go charging down the road, spending other people's resources, uh, only to find out that your idea wasn't well baked in the first place. So the theme of the book is to give the would-be social entrepreneur uh, a series of questions they need to ask themselves after going through what we call a, a, a number of due diligence phases. And if at the end of that particular due diligence phase you can't answer yes to most of those questions, you fail the pressure test and you should abandon, get out early and cheap and conserve those resources for something that might work. I think uh, adding to what Max just said, um, the distinction we make by using the term pressure test is that we suggest in, in, in certain instances, particularly where there's really high uncertainty, or what we call near Knightian uncertainty, that rather than going in trying to prove you're right, it is sometimes smarter to go in and try and prove you're wrong, provided you've structured your activity in the right manner. And that's the pressure testing of this. So it's doing the due diligence up front and not trying to force your case into a highly uncertain environment, but rather trying to find ways to show where you're wrong 
so that you can learn, adapt, redirect, and build your enterprise. Great. Now, to go back, Mac, to the point that you raised <clears throat> a little earlier, uh, all startups face risks, but you said that social enterprises face a much greater degree of uncertainty uh, than normal startups. Why, why is that the case, and what can be done about it? Well, we use the term uncertainty in the context of uh, an economist named Frank Wright, and uh, Frank Knight, sorry. And, and what Frank said was uh, that uh, when you have a distribution of possible outcomes, that's risk. When you don't even know what the distribution is, that's uncertainty. And this is one of the problems with the startup. You don't know whether there's going to be appropriate governance. You don't know whether there's a market. You don't know whether there's customers. You don't know the prices. You don't know what materials are going to cost and so on. So there's just huge amounts of uncertainty. And uh, truly uncertain, you know, you can't do anything because you just don't know what's going to happen. And that's why we coined the phrase near nighty and uncertainty, where the levels of uncertainty are enormous. Let me... Uh, suggest you that one of the features of what we're trying to do here is by putting the would-be social entrepreneur through their paces by giving them what we call these tough love questions to, to ask, is that we're driving the risk out. So the uncertainty doesn't go away. But if you're able to configure your, your uh, enterprise in such a way that you, you uh, uh, have driven out the risk, then you can afford to take on uncertain projects. Uh, Jim, uh, whom was this book for? Because uh, it sounds like, uh, I mean, you've written it for social entrepreneurs, but would it be relevant to other people, including conventional entrepreneurs? Absolutely, Mukul. I think, uh, one, we're, we're reticent to make very, very broad and general claims of applicability. But as we've, as we've put the drafts of the book out to various uh, communities, we've got overwhelmingly positive responses, with of course some, some good commentary uh, from other areas. For example, our School of Social Policy and Practice. The non-profit students uh, are finding ways to use this material. So the non-profit sector, of course, uh, we believe to be uh, a market that, or a sector of the economy as big as it is, that might find this very useful. So that's the one, you know, people in non-profits trying to do more with less. Uh, this book will help them do that. The second community are the, the funding agencies, foundations, philanthropists. Uh, the, one of the big cries out there today is transparency. So how do we know when these activities are doing what they claim they're doing? Uh, how do we compare them one against another? Uh, and, you know, let's face it, non-profits face the equivalent levels of com competition for funding that a regular firm does. And we think that this book will give them tools to communicate to their funding communities uh, fairly strongly how it is they're doing what they're doing and how they're measuring the social impact that they're having. So that's the second. The third are corporations. Many, many companies around the world today um, are looking at social impact indices or getting measures on, you know, measured on corporate social responsibility programs. And a lot of the folks we've spoken with in these companies say, look, this is not what we've typically done. How do we do it responsibly? You know, they have stockholders. They have stakeholders in the firm, out of the firm. And we think this, this will give them a, a set of tools to begin to think about what they're doing and do it in a manner that gives them uh, greater impact with the resources that they dedicate to these programs. Uh, Mac, how, how does your model help social entrepreneurs move from uncertainty to risk? Or in other words, from what is plausible to what is planable? The basic idea is to give them a series of uh, exercises to go through. And you start off really thoroughly uh, identifying what the real problem is and how it's dispersed. Uh, so, for instance, uh, is, is this problem something that's unique to a small territory or is it something that's you know, across a whole continent? Uh, make some decisions about who the initial target segment would be that's going to benefit. 
So you go for the segment that will benefit the most, but will also adopt your offering the easiest. Then uh, the next step is to start to think pragmatically about uh, what is uh, the, ac the competition today for you know, uh, the solution to this problem. And oftentimes it's simply doing nothing. So people have existed in many cases for you know, dozens if not hundreds of years uh, suffering from malnutrition or hunger or lack of education. And it's something that they're used to. So we have them have a look at what are you competing against because unless you can come up with something that from the beneficiary's point of view is uh, better than the nearest alternative, uh, you're wasting your time. So we have a look at the market characteristics and we look at the competition, we have a look at the finding the segment where you get the most traction as soon as possible. And then begin to think a little bit about the uh, uh, politics of going into this space and uh, what you need to do to make sure that you don't fall foul of uh, the, the politics. Uh, and so what you have is a systematic unfolding of more and more insight and in what it's going to take to really do this and make this happen. Great. Uh, uh, Jim, uh, since you mentioned fieldwork, uh, <clears throat> was a big part of <clears throat> the way in which you worked on this book. Uh, uh, could you tell me a little bit about what some of, what are some of the most common mistakes that you found social entrepreneurs make by not following the process that Mac just outlined? It's a good question, Mukul. Um, I think possibly at the top of that list is the formulation of a plan by a group of individuals with the best of intentions to go somewhere else in the world that they don't know a lot about. They perhaps know a lot about the subject that they're attending to in the, the part of the world they come from. Conceiving this plan, you know, on another continent, for example, going, raising resources, sometimes, you know, significant uh, amounts of resources, to go and do what they believe to be, you know, a wonderful uh, uh, activity and getting there and realizing that the way they envisaged it to work was never going to work. And yet they've committed themselves to this unilateral course of action, a business plan, if you will. And then spend two, three, four, five years floundering and learning uh, why it's not going to work the way they, they uh, envisioned it would. So that would be the top. The the others that come to mind are uh, cash flow management, and we stress this in the book. Um, as a result of a lot of these activities, what we find is that there's even greater uncertain uncertainty with respect to cash flow uh, in these types of environments. This is not new to anybody in entrepreneurship, but in these environments it can be even tougher to manage cash flows uh, for all sorts of reasons, regulatory, uh, availability of foreign exchange, for example, etc. So that would be the second one. And then uh, perhaps the third one to mention, and we have a list of them in the book, of course, is, uh, is the idea of redirection. Is how does one think about redirecting as, you know, the reality of, of being on the ground unfolds. And what we've tried to do in this book is attend to, to that because we know it happens. We've seen it in every single case we've been involved with this, is this realization that your plan needs to change if you want to keep doing what you're doing. But now you've got to redirect. And that means getting all your stakeholders on board to redirect, uh, reconfiguring your, your operations model, sometimes reconfiguring your funding model. So those would be the three that are, that are top of mind. Anything to add? I, I'd rather than add, rather sort of reinforce. I think one of the big tragedies that, is that people assemble a wonderful solution to a problem that they've not really studied hard enough for, their, for the context where it's going to be implemented. Uh, and then they'll go over with all that money and all that energy and all that uh, excitement and find that the so-called beneficiaries, the recipients of this largesse that they've put together is they just could care less or they're very, very resistant. 
And, and so all that money, which is desperately needed to help people who are in need, just goes to waste because people have been thoughtless. Uh, another big problem is that people go over and they set in motion this program and then find that they can't sustain it. And then they have to walk away from what they set up in the first place. And uh, a, a specific example here was uh, a case that was identified by one of the authors that we use. And he went over to East Africa uh, and while he was there he ran into a group of people who were were feeding children and what had happened is that mothers had stopped uh, nursing their children and fed the uh, fed these children with what they, they called wet uh, wet feed and uh, they ran out of funds and, and so what they did now is they just packed up their tents and went home and all those women who would have been able to continue feeding their children by breastfeeding uh, now could no longer do it they were out of lactation and so all these kids are under enormous stress because uh, the money's not there, the project's not there. Nobody's really thought through what the, uh, what the outcome would be in the event of failure. So you create dependence and then you fail. And so one of the big learnings that we got out of this program in observing what was happening over in Africa and uh, uh, other countries is uh, the whole idea that uh, if you have to leave, think about having to leave the project before you even start it. Think about how, if you have to leave, you, you leave behind what we call a light footprint. So that if you do have to go, you've had minimal damage on the people who's, uh, who are supposed to be the beneficiaries of what you're doing. And, and so to end, you know, I, I wonder, what would you like Knowledge at Wharton's readers and viewers to do uh, to participate in your project uh, so that you you can move it on to the next phase. Jim, what do you want? When did you go? Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> Firstly, to read it. Um, we, we've taken a slightly different approach in the publication of this book, as you know. Um, there's this e-book uh, that's going out pre-launch of the full book. And what we're trying to do is use it, you know, in the spirit of uh, of, of the approach of the book, you know, st start small uh, and, and change fast, is we'd like to get responses from readers out there and we're going to use, those, not every response, but we're going to use those responses to tweak, if you will, the balance of the book uh, pre-final publication um, in uh, October, November this year. And the third thing is spread the word. Uh, you know, if, if any of our readers uh, are in the space, you know, use the book to spread the word. And if any of our readers know people in the space, uh, please get the book out there. Um, we think it'll be useful. And everybody we've tested it with has found it very, very useful in the field, non-profit or for-profit. So hopefully our readers can help us do that. Mac, any final words? Yeah, you know, the basic uh, strategy at the moment is, is our e-books, a free book. We want to we wanna give anybody access to it if they want to download the first piece, which is the due diligence piece, which will help people really think through if they want to do something uh, that's going to do some good out there. And increasingly, people want to do that, particularly the younger generation. So uh, the idea is that if you, if you know of anybody who might be interested, just send them the, the, uh, the address, the, the URL, and they can download it. It's theirs. We don't want to make money out of this. Uh, what we want to do is, is, is have impact. And, uh, uh, you know, anybody who you know who's making charitable contributions and may be a little concerned about how well those contributions are being s uh, spent and dispersed, uh, send them the e-book the e and they can have a look at it because if I'm, I mean, I make donations, uh, I want to be able to think that my donations are being spent well rather than, you know, just spent uh, uh, squandered. And uh, the, uh, the idea would be is that uh, anybody who's making donations today might want to have a look at it and then challenge the people to whom they're making the donations to see whether they're in fact following the disciplines we suggest. Uh, to me, this is not a popularity contest. You know, we're not there to be popular, we're there to have impact. Right. Well, Mac, Jim, thank you so much for speaking sure. with Knowledge at Wharton. Yeah.
No, thank you. Uh, that's, Thanks so uh, much. It was good to chat to you.